Well, thanks for joining us for today's webinar titled Awesome Analytics and Fundraising. It's going to be a fun one, and we're going to talk uh, a bit about you know, really the simplicity of what needs to be done in, in analytics. Often it gets overcomplicated, and I really think this is something we can kind of nail down and, uh, and give some tools that can be used by a lot of people. So our agenda is going to be first to look at you know, what's the benefit of doing analytics, why do it, what's the ROI, key things that matter, and we actually really have boiled this down to one page a combination of both major giving and annual giving. So and we think it can be nailed down to that level. And then we're going to talk about pulling together your data, which usually uh, puts in a few challenges and maybe some roadblocks, but we think we can get through that. And then we're going to spend most of the time in a couple of examples, one in major giving, using analytics to find new prospects, and then we're going to dive into annual giving and look at appeals and which ones are working best and how to determine that. And then we'll have a, a Q&A at the end. So this will last roughly 30 minutes and then a Q&A. I'm Doug. Uh, I am the... Uh, President and CEO of Advisor. We've done a lot of work in data analytics and fundraising and across a variety of other industries uh, here and overseas. We have roughly 150 fundraising clients, uh, heavy higher ed bent, although we do a bunch of work with not-for-profits, membership-based, and more and more healthcare. And uh, we're well regarded by Gartner Forrester, so for those of you looking at business intelligence and whatnot, uh, we get good reviews from them for our work. So just jumping right in. Um, why do you do this? Well, in major giving, uh, these are examples from our clients. You know, we have a number of clients who have, by using data, to find prospects that may not have been assigned before, getting them into the cultivation pipeline. Uh, they have found million dollar donors uh, really rapidly. And so that's clearly one of the benefits. We've also, by using data and analytics to help manage the major giving team, we've been able to get average ask levels up by 35%, which is worth $75 million to one of our clients. And that's because you, know, you start looking at the ask levels. We just had a discussion with one of our clients a couple of weeks ago. There was a million dollar ask on the table. And is that good or bad? Um, the, the person had a capacity rating of 25 million plus and was highly engaged and already given 8 million to the institution. So that's a discussion that you know, maybe that ask level uh, should be more like 10 or 15 and should be a naming con uh, a naming of a, a, a program or a facility or something. So that's the kind of discussions the data drives. Uh, time to close by looking at movement through stages and just having discussions about some people get stuck at solicitation, some people have trouble getting prospects out of qualification. We have a bunch of examples where pace through the pipeline has increased. In one example, 40%, uh, which is 14 months quicker start to close. That's revenue in the door. Annual giving. Uh, try to get the right messages to the right people so that they connect, they're more likely to give. Uh, and, you know, we have an example where by doing that, one of our clients cut their end-of-the-year mail send by 25%. They sent 25% less mail pieces and got triple the revenue. And that was worth $5 million. We've uh, been able to get Cybunt reacquisition rates up from 35 to 50%. Those are lapsed donors being reacquired, $5 million a year. Increasing end of year retention by focusing the call campaign on most likely prospects will give an example of this, and so forth and so on. So these are all examples where using the data, doing analytics, can help drive immediate returns, and this is obviously what the whole game is about. It's doing these kinds of things. So what actually matters and how do we do it? We're going to get into examples in a few minutes. And assigning the best prospects, there's a lot of um, stuff being written. There's all kinds of consultants out there. Um, there's really, I think it comes down to, in our work, three areas. You know, what's their capacity? Uh, how engaged or attached are they? And what's their interest area? So, you know, capacity, there's wealth screeners that look at hard assets and soft assets. And there's, uh, even if you don't have that, and I know some of our clients have had budget issues, uh, just get wealthy zip codes or overseas, there's the same data. There's data on, on communities. And you know that's at least a proxy. So there's a way to get something on capacity for your entire population. It um, doesn't need to be a big deal. Obviously, the richer and some of the wealth screeners do an awesome job, the better. Attachment, uh, how engaged are they? We're going to see an example of this in a few minutes, but most of you have the data to do this. You know, Are they coming to your events? Have they participated in sports? Have they been giving consistently? Have they been clicking through on your newsletter? That's all indications that they're engaged in your institution and your messaging. 
and especially the not-for-profit world, you sometimes need to engage mechanisms or create mechanisms to drive engagement because it's not as natural as a membership-based organization or a, or a university where there's more natural ways to come back and connect. But there's a whole lot of ways to do that. And then we'll show you how you can use the data. And then interest areas. This often gets left off, but this is pretty key because if you know somebody's interested in science, uh, they're more likely to give to it if they're interested in the football program. And there is a couple of really good ways to figure that out. One, one is which articles in the newsletter are people clicking through on? They're telling you they have an interest in a specific area. You can do reunion surveys or other forms of sur surveys to ask questions about what their interest areas are and then align the fundraising efforts around those interests. So these three things are the big three. And there's a bunch of nuances and granularity underneath, and we'll look at some of that. And then you have to engage effectively. So if you have the right prospects, you then need consistent cross-organization messaging to those prospects. We have some clients who have segmented prospects into different groups. And make sure that all of the messaging from the entire organization, fundraising and general communications, is geared around those message areas, whether it be athletics or maybe it's social justice issues or it might be healthcare, it might be arts and sciences. Um, the gift officer interaction, you know, clearly if the uh, prospect is assigned, you want to make sure the pool size is proper, typically 100, 125, that they're accessing or penetrating the pool properly. We generally like to see on a touch basis, you know, 80 to 85 percent penetration in a 12-month period. If it's a visit, maybe that's, you know, 45 to 50 percent in a 12-month period. But you need to see engagement, and if that's not happening, uh, probably the wrong group of prospects or maybe the wrong gift officers with those prospects. And then what contact types? So there's a bunch of things here. Those tend to be the majors. Solicitation is the ask match to the interest area. I mean, that's more likely to cause a result. What's how does the ask look compared to the capacity rating and the attachment? Back to that example I gave, a million dollar potential gift. Is that good? Maybe it's not good if the, if the person could have given $15 million. So that needs to be a discussion because you don't want to leave you know, that kind of money on the table. Then yield, you want to look at close rates. So the right prospects, capacity, they're engaged, they're interested in specific areas. You're consistently messaging that. Uh, they're being followed up on. They're getting asks that match interest areas and fit their capacity and attachment levels. And then you know, they're brought to a pipeline and closed. Those are the things that really matter, and I think you really can boil it down to that. On the annual giving side, Philly really want to see you know, increased participation. There's the overall trend line, which a lot of people look at, but then and we'll see an example of this when we get to the annual giving uh, example. Um, it's, it breaks into are you retaining the current donors, how well are you doing that, how well are you reacquiring lapsed donors, and how are you doing at acquiring non-donors. There's like three different sub-problems here. We've seen examples where an awesome job of retaining the current donors, but a really bad job of bringing people back once they leave or you know, bringing new people into the fold. It's hard to get growth. And then part of that is using the appeals to create strong connection yield. You want to match the appeal message and the media to the prospect interest and preferred delivery. Like if it's an older alum who does not use email a lot and really likes sciences, please don't send the person a lot of emails on the football program. It's unlikely to work or you know, the, it's the end of the year, it's time to give. You'll see an example where there tends to be a barrage of emails coming to non-donors at the end of the year with really bland messages and a lot of clients and that's usually not going to be real effective to actually drive people away. Don't over or under touch. There's a balance. Generally, uh, we like to see between 6 and 12 solicitation touches per year. We see examples where it's up at 30. Um, we see examples where you've got great appeals that are only touching people, you know, two to three times a year, and that's usually not enough frequency to bring somebody over the line. Then, of course, you want to manage the yield. A good appeal over 2% is, is really good, and over 5% is great. Uh, generally, you know, it also depends, obviously, if you're going after non-donors or, or current donors, but we'll see an example where you can look at this thing and drill in pretty quickly. So the data, those are the things that matter. Where does it come from? We did use this chart in a, another webinar in the winter, um, a deep data discovery made easy, but it sort of brings out the concept. You've got a bunch of stuff in an ERP system, um, whether it be Banner or Advance or Blackboard CRM or Agile on Millennium, whatever you're using. 
and it has stuff that can help you understand you know the characteristics of my large donors and who else has those characteristics which is a great question the entity table is going to have biographical and geographical information. It's probably got wealth scores that are in their class year. But then there's other tables like employment. If you just have employment, it's useful for when you're making a solicitation or you're, you're trying to qualify the prospect and you're down at that level. But in, in, a, in a portfolio, what you really need to do is parse something out of it. Like, for example, out of the title, do they have a C-level job? Is the word president or vice or chairman or something like that in the title. If so, that's a flag that can be put in the entity table that this person has a C-level job or degrees, obviously useful in a variety of ways. But if you're trying to answer a question like this, something needs to be done to synthesize the data, the flag. Maybe you want to go into they have an advanced degree or an MBA or a law degree or an MD degree. That would be an indication of higher wealth. You can flag it in the degrees table and bring it in the entity table. Similarly with giving. You know, obviously you want to look at giving and giving patterns. But for modeling purposes, and you'll see this in attachment scores, I want to look at how many of the last five years have they actually made a gift. And you might put a threshold of you know, over 20 bucks or 100 bucks or something, depending on the purpose. How about the you know, six to 10 year period? And that's all things that can be calculated of this and then transferred back to the entity table. So now you've got more information about the entity synthesized out of the data that's in the CRM system that you can use. And there's a bunch of other stuff. Event attendance sometimes is in the CR system, sometimes it's sitting in another database or even spreadsheets. But this is where you can figure out you know, how active have they been the last five years, uh, six to ten years back. This has a tail. Go back much more than five years, it kind of fades. Go back more than ten, it's probably irrelevant. And then what type of uh, uh, attendance or event was it? Some of the events have more connection, more engagement and than others, and that can be figured out analytically. And this information can also be linked back to the entity table. Newsletter click-throughs is another one. We've got some clients using this. Most just discard the email sends. But this is people telling you, in general, you want to go back maybe the last year with this, not much further, the last 12 months. How many times have they clicked through? More, they're more engaged. What have they clicked through on? They're actually telling you by what uh, URLs they click on, what their interest area is, and so forth, reunion surveys. And social media plays a role. but we would generally find uh, our clients have in data that is somewhere available to them a lot of information that can be used. And this, uh, this comes from the Gartner Group, but I think this conceptually shows what you need to do with the data. You have raw data, newsletter click-throughs, event attendance. You need to explore it and see what's in it, transform it, create some of those calculations, improve it. And this is the work of people who are more analytical, um, data discovery analytics, that's the kind of work we'll do to get our clients going. Uh, often there's you know, analysts on client teams who can do this. And you iterate this. It's not a here it is. It's like you do it, you go back, you adjust it, and this, this thing really captures how it works. And then at some point you've got attachment scores. Uh, you'll see them in a minute. And those are knowledge gained from reusable transformations that can then be put into the load of the regular data so then all of a sudden this is there every day and it's doing what was found out of this. But you can't just put I think these two pages, the messages, there's a lot of data out there. You can't just throw it in the database and use it. You have to actually synthesize it and create some structure out of it and then it becomes really useful. So let's look at a couple of examples. First we're going to look at major giving, finding new prospects. Then we're going to jump into annual giving, which appeals are working. So I'm going to click a link. I'm using Advisor Software since that's my company, but there's other ways of doing this. I'm opening a browser. It's opening what we call a project on a web server. It unpacks the data, and it's building up a set of pages. Our load time for something like this is usually 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, this is a fairly small data set. It uh, looks like 94,000 um, prospects, and it would have loaded uh, we did a load, we typically load in the middle of the night and then put a file somewhere. So this file, file I opened would have had roughly maybe 20 tables out of the database and maybe some Excel spreadsheet it loaded from. That's what you're seeing here. And this is uh, for finding prospects. So it starts with a, a bunch of pages. This is the prospect list page. This is where you actually have a list and it's a bunch of names and could have phone numbers and whatnot, but it's details on each entity. And it's saying I'm looking at 55,000 people. Uh, I've excluded some. It looks like it came up 
with the unrated prospects filtered out. So I'm just looking at the rated prospects and it looks like I've got all record types. And there's a page over here that describes what here, uh, which I'm going to hide just to create some more room. So the next page, we're organized in what we call horizontal logic. The next page has information on ratings. It's just the same 55,000 people. You know, here's a list of them all. Uh, the top donor on that list is Harley Oliver, who gave 40 million. These are not real names, so don't I'll try to find Harley. Uh, he actually isn't a person. And down at the bottom, there's a bunch of non-donors. This is the same list, just simplified as in the first page. So one thing we find when we do analytics is you need a count to show what you're looking at. And having the list here so you actually see who you're looking at really matters. And then the ratings page is a page of a chart on capacity rating and attachment scores. So this is showing me that I have 166 50 million plus rated donors and I have over here uh, the blue uh, roughly 19,000, 25 to 50,000 rated donors and I'm colored in the hotter colors are the higher ratings and then the cooler colors are the lower ratings and this you know could have been a wealth screening score, it could have been a prospect research generated uh, score. It's something that often the software, like our software, if somebody had a wealth engine score from this year, we could use that. And we could have a rule that if there wasn't a wealth engine score from this year, we could take the target analytics score from two years ago and there was neither, maybe grab a zip code, Forbes wealthy zip code, and do some translation with that to create some buckets or bins here that are synthesized. That's the example of taking the data and synthesizing it. And over here, we're looking at attachment scores. What this is telling me, so I have 584 people who are owners. So these are people that when we go to the detail will have been on a bunch of alumni committees. You know, they've given in the last, each of the last 10 years. They've been to a ton of reunions, played sports. They did everything. They're all in. And over here, the disconnected, there's a lot of them. There's 27,000 of them basically graduated and left and haven't done anything. And the coloring is consistent. So I have the hot colors, the high rate. As I actually say I have some high rated disconnected. And I've got some blue over here uh, who are the lower rated uh, owners. So there's a spread. So this drives scenarios and stories. So you could look at this and maybe say, why do I have really high rated disconnected prospects? Or you might say, I wonder if I have any really high capacity, highly attached prospects who aren't staffed because those would be the best ones to assign out and maybe even justify adding some staff. So if I want to grab maybe these bars, uh, there's five of them, a half million to a million, this is a million to five. I just sweep over these with the mouse and it shows me there's 6,306 prospects. This list changes to show who they are, who are rated half a million dollars and up. And over here, the coloring is showing me the concentration. So there's 2,357 of them that are disconnected, but at the top, only that's only 8.8% .8 of the disconnected. So it's a small percentage, but a large number of the owners, it's like 162 out of 584 owners are high capacity, that's 28%. So the, the good news is the higher rated are more engaged. Let's look at the highly engaged. You have 21% of them. So let's drop down and exclude the gray, just drop in on the high capacity. Let's now grab the highly engaged owners. So there's 1,527 people, here's the list, who are high capacity and highly engaged. So the way this works, the next page is staffing. It's the workflow here. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, here's how there's 1,527 are staffed. 269 aren't staffed, so that's maybe a surprise. That's a lot. And then it uh, looks like, because there's no name over here, that's how I know that. Uh, Megan has 116 of them. Dan Law, I can see Dan Law's got 67, but what jumps is the bright red. So Dan Law's got 67 of the highest capacity, most attached people. So you know, he ought to be really good, or we ought to do some juggling there. But our mission here was to find these. So let's grab the 269. Again, I select, get rid of everything else. Here they are. The next page is a map. Where do they live? Yeah, it's sort of all over. Uh, looks like not many in Chicago. Two in Chicago, maybe something in a suburb. Uh, what about the Boston area? Looks like I've got you know a few in Boston. Uh, it looks like somebody out here, whatever that is, uh, one in Wellesley. But boy, my VP is going to the San Francisco Bay Area. So let's grab the Bay Area. Just again, select it, get rid of everything else. Now if I go back to the first page, I've got 24 people who are highly engaged, 
uh, high capacity and live in the Bay Area. And Virginia Chen, here's her ID number, has given a million four, lives in Atherton, class year, no staff, high rig, got it. If I want to export this list, I can go down here, export this. This is a web version, it runs in tablets and browsers. This will drop this down to my desktop or my iPad or wherever I want to put it as a as cell file, which I can then you know, execute. Let's get these 24 people uh, signed up. And by the way, somebody might say, well, I actually forgot how I got here. Well, this is something called a flight recorder, which is tracking you know, everything I've done to get to this point. It looks like I selected in this bar chart up here um, attachment, so I did that. And before, it looks like I had selected up here um, in the capacity. So here's all the things I had done to get here. So this is keeping track if I forget, and then I can bookmark points and go back and forth. So it's it's really helpful if you want to like save this point, my high capacity, highly engaged Bay Area, and maybe tomorrow, you know, somebody gets somebody does something and gets more engaged, they'll pop into the list. So now let's go a little deeper. I've got my list. Let's look at these attachment scores. Where are they from? What can we learn? 24 people. Let's sort them. Uh, there's a modeling algorithm that our software creates, which embeds in the project, and every time the data loads, it looks at the things that matter, which for this institution are volunteer committees in the last 10 years, gifts in the last five years, gifts five to 10 years before that, uh, numbers of reunions, uh, sports played as a student, and student activities. So it takes all of these and runs some math and figures out that's a 1476. And then it bins it. That's in the owner group, and the rest of them are highly engaged. And if we had everybody, there'd be higher numbers and there'd be lower numbers. At this level, I've got the detail. So, I mean, there's not a lot. They're all giving. These guys are reunion junkies. It looks like they're coming, all of them. I can't really change what they did in college and sports. But what I can change is it looks like only one of them uh, down here, Adrian, has been on a volunteer committee. The rest have not. So one of my goals for this dinner, I need to get these people on a good volunteer committee because that's going to engage them even more and help cultivate them. So we've taken just a summary, that bar chart of the five bins broken it down. Here's the detail behind it and how you could use it for cultivation. And I'd say, you know, the, as you build these kinds of scores, the weighting varies a lot by institution. We have one school we did this, reunions was over here on the left, most important, because they have a very strong reunion program. And another school, you know, it's over more like this. So the weighting of these things balances and it needs to be done nuanced to the institution. Uh, pretty easy to do. And then back to that Gartner slide, this just embeds in the, the data, in you know, when the data loads into our app, it gets rescored and people get regrouped. So continuing just a couple more things, let's look at the giving history, because that's relevant for our dinner. 24 people, most of them have given 1,000 to 5,000, you know, up to 50,000 total. A couple of large donors, I can see them here. There's a spike. Let's for a minute go up here and subtract um, the top two donors and see what the pattern looks like without them. Um, so I got, I'm down to 22. Yeah, the overall as a group, you know, they were giving at like a 25,000 year level. Now they're up to close to 100. Numbers of, everything's going up. They're just way below their capacity. So this is good. Let's bring the, uh, them all back. Now I might want to say, uh, is there affiliations? Let's go to the affiliation page. Uh, 24 people, some are in the 50s, 60s. There's a scattering here. Um, alums, uh, parents, partners, there's 24 people, so it looks like a bunch of them are affiliated with undergraduate multiple degrees, some also law. Yeah, this isn't so helpful. Student sports and activities for the 24. Some football, looks like two. Uh, fraternity sororities, so there's some in there. Let's drill down on this chart. So I'm going to go up here, drop it down. Student work, college outing club. Well, let's grab that for a second. I'm just trying to see if there's uh, something that might connect these people together. So grab the college outing club. Uh, two people, they also the color of football, rugby, let's look at affiliation. Yeah, oh, these people, wow, the two people, college outing club, 50, 51, 52, alums, it looks like two undergraduate school alums, and one went on to the grad, uh, law school and got a degree, so these people ought to know each other. So now as I'm working this dinner, I probably want to sit them together, and I maybe want to get somebody else from those same years who had the same interests, who presumably knows them. Maybe this is a person that's all in and is a current large donor at that table with them. So just to summarize with this, go back to the beginning. Uh, we took a, a set of 
uh, large group of uh, 55,000 um, rated prospects and we mined through it and found a group of 24 in the Bay Area and we now have an action plan to go hopefully cultivate them by getting them onto a volunteer committee and get them giving at their capacity level. So that's the kind of things that data can do in major giving and if you go back to the premise that um, you know capacity matters, attachment or engagement matters, and interest matters. The missing piece of that would have been the interest one. Uh, but we got, you know, those other two you can do a lot with, and that's the kind of thing we see all the time in our clients. And you want this to be dynamic, updating, and you know, kind of really easy to use like that. Let's dive quickly into uh, annual giving. Same idea. I'm going to, whoops, click a link. It's going to open what we call a project. It's going to unpack the data into RAM on a server. This is a couple of million appeals, um, probably 60,000 alumni again. So it's loading into RAM, then it brings up a project. One of our concepts here, it's important to take the data and portray it in a way that's useful for solving the problem at hand. And annual giving is very different than leadership giving. So this is going to open in a second with a dashboard, uh, which is a summary of the program. And again, it's got pages. We'll go through just the ones over here on the left, which are annual fund specific. Uh, some text that describes it's on the page. And here, if I look at this program, uh, had a bad year in 08, so did a lot, but it came back up. Participation came up. It's been down a little. This year is not completed, but that's okay. Giving fiscal year to date, slug in December, uh, May, June still to come. Cumulative, we're doing pretty good. Some stats over here. Um, balance of are they current, lapsed, or non-donor? This is a pretty good ratio. Often we see this is, you know, you like to see this being 2x the, the lapsed donors. Um, Sometimes the, the lapsed donors are bigger. It depends on maturity of the program. This is good. And we break the green, uh, the current, into five-year consecutive, four-year, three-year. We look at have they given consistently in the October, December period, the March, June period, and are they, you know, have they given in this year? So this would have locked in the current donor. The live month would have been they gave in fiscal 14, and this, the yeses would have also given in fiscal 15. So tactically, um, it's, it's, it's May right now. We've got a calling program. We've got a few weeks left in the fiscal year. What should we do? Well, one example would be let's grab the three, do three four, and five-year consecutive donors, this group. That is 17,000 people. Let's drop in on them. See the charts all change to show what they've done. Um, some of them have been October and December donors the last three years. Uh, they obviously, let's grab them. So these are the three, four, and five-year consecutive donors who gave in October through December of each of the last three years. Um, and some of them have not given this year, this group. So these are the people that have typically given in October to December, but haven't yet given this year. And there are 327 of them. So if I'm running a call campaign, I want to go over to the entity list table. And here they are, ID number, it's uh, Gaylord, alum class, three-year consecutive donor, given this much. This year, nothing. Last year, 50,000. Year before, 50,000. Year before, 25. Uh, something. Else. Here's a whole group. Let's get this out of here real quick to the call center and go. That's an example of tactical mining for an annual giving program. Let's go a little deeper and look at some strategy. So again, this is overall participation. This page breaks it down. Really, let's just focus on these line charts. There's a lot on this page, but if I look at Total participation in terms of live but retention, this group's doing great. I mean, it was down in 08, but it's been up over 75%. This year's not complete. I'm not worried about that. Lapsed donor reacquisition, it had been 35%. It came way up in 09. Uh, I guess, you know, bad year in 08 got it. So we, that's, that's sort of what happened over here. That came up and brought this back. But since then, it's been continually falling off. So it looks like I may have a problem with lapsed donor reacquisition. And then non-donor acquisition, it's been bouncing around, but this year we're almost done and it's like terrible. So I think I've got a problem in this program uh, in those two areas. I'm going to come back and look at this in a minute. Then I want to look at appeals. This is for the entire program. How do we like to look at it? There's some stats over here. Uh, looks like I've done 845,000 sends so far in this fiscal year to 55,000 people. I've got 14,000 gifts, that many donors, and so forth and so forth. Here's some overall. Uh, looks like I sent a bunch of stuff out in these quarters, and then uh, we're looking at response percent by program. So this is um, these are different programs. We'd like to see them at least two percent. Uh, Five percent is great. These threshold lines. If I just zoom in on this for a second, grab one of these. If I click this green C program, 
going to light up down below here what we call a heat map. So this is a map of all of the appeals and their size by how many were sent. So the sum of all of this would be this uh, 585,000 total sends. Then they're colored by the response. So red is zero and really good is 22%. So if I look at this green C program, which is made up of several appeals, it's doing really good overall. It's almost 65%. But I've got some things like this one that's doing great. It's running 11 and 0.95%. But I've got some parts of it that aren't doing well. So I can, that's what this is. We're taking the individual appeals and grouping them into the programs and looking at the program in a total because there can be sequencing across these things. Maybe this is the last one that follows everything else. So there's more context to this. But this is a way to look at um, the overall appeals and see what's working, what's not. And if I look overall at this program, uh, I've got you know, a handful that are doing pretty good and a lot of them that aren't doing well. The last thing we want to look at is touch points. A couple of charts here. These are the people, uh, the alums, um, by ID number. So there's a bunch of them at the top. It looks like they're getting one appeal in this 12-month moving window. Uh, so uh, this ID got one. And we're colored by here whether they're blue general letter, green personalized letter, uh, yellow telephone, and then red email. Down here I've got people up at, you know, this one's up at... Uh, Looks like uh, 20, 27, that's a lot. And I can sort of see the bulk of this, all this red, are email appeals. So now let's go back, because the issue was Cybun, uh, reacquisition was falling off. So I'm going to go back over here and just grab the Cybuns, drop the whole thing down to just them, go back and look at appeals. So these are appeals to Cybuns. What's worked, what hasn't? Um, Good news is I've got a half a dozen over here that have worked. Let's look at what those appeals are. I'm going to select them. And down below, uh, I can sort of see the coloring. Are, are these you know, half a dozen really good appeal programs? I can see when they were sent. Uh, you know, the web, some web, some blue, some letters, phone calls. So it looks like I started with some web, some general mail, some phone calls, and then some more web. But what's interesting is a lot of the volume, all this gray, had poor results. These things had some really good results. And this is, if you were to continue this, you'd want to test what was the messaging in this? Who was it sent to? We have clients who have done an awesome job of figuring that out and able to then cut a lot of this back. That's back to that ROI. Cut the mail sends by 25% and triple the revenue because you don't do this kind of stuff that's not working for this population. You do the things that are working. Now let's look at this for the touch points. What can we learn? Well, uh, the color here is the touches from the effective appeals, and then the gray is everything else. So one thing I'm seeing is, you know, especially the people that get in high touches, a lot of it's touches from the unsuccessful uh, programs. And if I was to just drop in on the, uh, you can sort of see here what's happening. This is over time. Um, let's just reselect everything for a second. If I color everything, I'm going to see the overall uh, to the side months what's happening. Uh, this is across a one-year period. Uh, and each of these, this is email, phone, personal letter, and general letter. I can sort of see I've got emails going out consistently throughout the year, heavily at the end. I've got telephone in the fall and the spring, personalized letters sort of strewn across and general letters uh, uh, around the period. Let's go back uh, to the, just the appeals that were working. And let's drop this timetable, as we call it, down on just that. I'm going to exclude and just drill on, on what's working. And you're going to see a very different pattern. I mean, the touches, uh, the high end, you know, is six. We're getting them over. Some of them are coming in sooner. That's good. And I can sort of see I have an email at the beginning of the year, phone calls, one general letter, more phone calls, one email, but a very different makeup of what's working for this group than the general program that's largely not working for this group. So that's, that's a run through, a quick run through annual giving uh, from both a tactical perspective and, um, then a strategic look at a program. So as kind of we wrap up and go to Q&A, you know, our, our proxy here is people can do this, and you know, it's not a lot of things you need to look at, but you need to look at it creatively, and you need to be able to interact with it and navigate through it like we just did. And when you do it right, um, literally, that example I went through in the major giving, clients have done that and found million-dollar donors who committed within six months because they're the right people, they're engaged, they're interested, you know what they're interested in, and you bring them in. Ask levels go up, time to close, all this stuff happens and it's real. So we would um, just encourage you to think broadly about the data you have at hand. 
realize that analytics is not like really, really, really complicated. It can be really simplified. It can be done in scenarios and stories. Uh, we usually like to have or recommend a couple of people, two or three people sit in a room and do it together as a discovery exercise. But literally, this, the, the three scenarios I just ran through, one in major giving to find a group of high prospective donors to get assigned with a purpose for a meeting, and then the two annual, tactical, who do I want to call at the end of the year, and where do I need to focus, side month reacquisition, why isn't it working, I'm sending too many generic emails all over the place, if I focus things down, I ought to be able to bring it up, and it's, it's literally that simple, the issues are um, definable, and you know, there's us and a bunch of other people who out there, consultants and so forth, who can help you get a handle on the data if you're challenged with that. But even that's not that hard. We're putting projects in like this in four to eight weeks and enabling, empowering teams to have those discussions. And that's what we call awesome analytics. It is awesome because the data is there and when you get it into a form, uh, you get answers to these kinds of questions and um, you get these kinds of results. So, uh, time for some questions. And we'll, uh, there's two ways you can put questions in. There's a chat line at the bottom where you can type in questions um, and, and, and uh, we'll answer them. And also, if you're really bold, you can, uh, there's a uh, prompt where you can put your hand up. And if you do that, uh, we can unmute you and can ask your question live to the audience and we'll answer it uh, in person, not live. Will the slides be available? Yes. Uh, so we've recorded this and we will post the webinar with the slides within the week and let you know about it. Does a remittance envelope in a newsletter count as a solicitation touch? Um, yes, that would generally count as a mailing because you're pushing a message out asking somebody for money. And you know, the issue is if you do that 30 times, you're gonna like in any market, you're gonna dull your audience. And at some point, you know, it's gonna go, if it's a mail piece in the recycling bin really quick, or if it's an email, eventually they're gonna just put you in the opt-out folder. Uh, so yeah, you gotta watch that. Uh, we had a client last week that was a few weeks ago we were at where it was really bimodal. They had a group of people, they were hitting, uh, I use the word hitting, it may not be the best word, but 25 to 30 times a year largely with emails. They had another group that were getting you know, solicitations you know, two to three times a year and a group in the, like a 20% in the middle, it was just about right. But you know they really could save a lot of money by cutting back the overtouching and not push them away and refocus some energy back on the entire population and get them up into that six to 12. Where did you get the stats on the number of solicitation touches per year? Uh, that's, we, we worked at like 150 or more clients, so it's from our client work. Um, so it's a, it's a synthesis of that. I'm assuming this includes all channels of communication, direct, yes, it includes all channels, direct mail, phone, emails, and so forth. Uh, and those also, the touches align with general sales and marketing. I mean, the uh, consumer goods companies, anybody doing you know, uh, B2C uh, marketing, which is what this is, is, is focused on frequency of communication, getting enough, but, but not overtouching. I mean, it, so that, that's where that's coming from. Can you give an example of using dark data for major gift prospect identification? Uh, sure, so that hand-drawn slide. Um, so, so just, I'm gonna actually go back to the slide. The concept of dark data that comes from actually the Gartner Group and, and some others have started coining at that. So this is data by definition that's generated by a system to do something, but it's usually not thought of for analytics or reporting. Uh, so you know, click through data uh, would be a great example of when you send an email to 50,000 people uh, and they click on things that newsletter sending engine is, is recording everybody who clicked, when they clicked on it and what they clicked on. So it knows that, you know, Joe came in at 233 and clicked on the article about the new football stadium and then Mark came in at 234 and clicked on the neuroscience article. Then Joe clicked on the neuroscience article right after him. But that data is not designed for analysis uh, and it's therefore called dark data. Um, and we, we run into this in manufacturing. The stuff that runs factory floor lines is designed to run the factory floor lines, not to be used for analysis. But in both cases, the data is really good for analysis because in fundraising, that's people telling you they're interested in what you're doing, so it's a form of engagement or attachment. And then they're also, by what they're clicking on, they're giving you that interest area. 
And the manufacturing, that factory floor data is telling you where there's bottlenecks, what specifically is causing things to slow down. It's all the machine data. So there's a huge market here to take uh, the data that has been dark and bringing it into the light and connecting it with uh, the core operating systems, CRM data, whatever you call it, and integrating, blending it, synthesizing, and so it could be used as one. So this is, uh, you know, what do you have? I mean, I know not everybody does electronic newsletters. Obviously, paper newsletters don't do this as well. Um, but think broadly about how people are showing engagement uh, and where that data could be collected, how it could be put together, because if you can get it into anything, a spreadsheet, a text file, any form of electronic storage, it can be swept in and integrated with your uh, CRM system. And for the nonprofits um, on, on the phone who have less natural engagement mechanisms, you know, we've done uh, and we've seen some real successes here about using uh, people to create events. Uh, you know, we have a big uh, global not-for-profit where they created basically the concept of ambassadors in different cities around the U.S. and used those ambassadors to put on events which they would have people come to to talk about the programs they were running. And then, uh, you know, you then, you've got a local relationship manager and you've got relationships identified and you're creating engagement. And it's not a natural one, uh, but there's, there's a lot of ways of doing this. Some of our clients at the reunions are very strategic about tracking even the courses that people, you know, there's like a lot of reunions have these, you can drop in on courses, there's alumni things going on. Uh, scan the name badge and figure out where the people are going because that's showing you what they're interested in. So a little bit of thinking outside the box, there's a lot of this stuff out there. Uh, that's what we call the dark data. Does, does advisor pull from advance as it updates or are there Excel sheets that are needed to be pulled from advance and then uploaded? How real time is the data? Great question. So uh, our software, as do most of the other business intelligence software, load from all forms of data. So we will load, usually the CRM system is in SQL Server or Oracle is a form of database that might be in Sybase or some other things. But So uh, we can load that. Uh, we can load this. This stuff might not be in SQL Server or Oracle. Let's say this is an advanced system and this is an Oracle database and we're loading 50 tables because they're not they're not flattened. They're pretty much the raw source tables. If there's a warehouse, you know, that would simplify it. Um, we still want to load some of the detailed the gift transactions and, and some of the events tables. So we're generally going to load out of advanced Oracle um, 15 to 70 tables. Um, then there's this other stuff over here that may or may not be in advance, or maybe an analyst just wants to play with it, like in a sandbox mode. So this could be an access or Excel or text files. We'll load that in as well. So we run in memory. What you were seeing was behind it was a collection of tables that look something like this. And then we affiliate and link them. So if the uh, newsletter click-throughs come in and they happen to have the same ID number as the NTD, NTD table, we go, awesome, we can link them together, we can copy things between them. If they don't have the ID number, well, they have at least got email. And so we can match and link and copy on email. The caveat is if somebody's got a different email in the newsletter than in, is in the entity table, we're not going to make the match. But, um, you know, we're pretty good, and most of our peers out there in the market are pretty good at figuring out how to blend this stuff once we get it. So first part is, yeah, we load a variety of different data types, and then we can load them on demand or on a, a set schedule. So if we load them on demand, on someone who was to open one of the two projects I demoed, it would go to Oracle and load the... 40 tables, we we'll go pick these things up wherever they are, they've got to be on a network somewhere that's accessible, and then we would put them all in RAM and you would have the experience I showed you. More often, uh, what happens, especially in fundraising, is uh, we load once a day, uh, say at 3 in the morning after the systems do their backups, and then we put a, a file, it's like a big Excel spreadsheet somewhere on a file server, and then the web server or the whatever versions are running are running that project file. Uh, and that does a couple of things. It takes load off the database during the day because nothing's touching the database other than this once a day load. And the second thing is most people prefer to know they have a snapshot that's consistent so you don't have you know, somebody doing analysis at nine in the morning and they go in their boss at noon and the data's changed. Uh, you know, this way it's gonna be stable until the next daily update. 
And I would also add that you know, we've got clients where it's on the production daily update, but the power users can push an update in the middle of the day because you know some bunch of stuff came in in the morning. They want to see what that's done. Yeah, you can just reload it on the demand. So uh, long-winded way of answering how we get data, um, how we load it, and, and what the frequency is. We have both monetary and tangible donors. Can you give an example of a good way to get a tangible donor to become a monetary donor? This could be a good application. Oh. So tangible and monetary donors. Well, so let me just add, answer this conceptually. Typically with analytics, what you would do is if you have tangible donors who have become monetary donors, um, the, you would do use a couple of things. In modeling, which our software does, it's pretty easy. There's other webinars that show how to do it, but you would take the tangible donor population is the base population. That's maybe that's say it's 6,000 people. And then out of that, you know, say 200 have become monetary donors at the level um, you want. Uh, so that's the target population. And then the, the predictive modeling or regression based modeling will determine what makes the 200 different than the rest of the 6,000. You know, it could be they've been to certain events or you know, they knew they'd had a connection with one of the staff or they had certain degrees. It's going to figure that all that out and put a weighting sequence against it so it knows that, you know, this counts more than that. And then uh, you can use those factors because then you know the kinds of things that are most likely to produce a, a large monetary donor out of a tangible donor. And then you can score the rest of the population, get a ranked ordering of who is highest to have that change and who is lowest. The attachment scores I show were kind of like that, where you know the ordering of the volunteer committees, the giving, the reunions, that was determined by the model, and we just had them laid out that way. But that says that you know the single biggest thing you can do to move somebody forward is to get them on a key volunteer committee. Uh, you get the same thing out of a model for the monetary and tangible donors, and then you, we had a rank list. You'd get the same thing. The model will produce a score like that. So. The rank orders them, and then it you know, tells you what's most influential to change behavior. Uh, it's the cool thing about analytics, and what we, we what we love about it. How are we doing? Is it considered overtouching when sending an appeal in the mail and email to follow up a couple of weeks later? Yeah, yes, uh, those count as separate touches. Um, I, I would say to I'm not sure. So there's, we've seen people organize these in different ways. The demo I showed, which let me go back to it, um, had the concept of programs. I glossed over that, but we'll go back to the appeals. So they, this client, this is disguised data, would group the appeals into programs and sequence them. So uh, if the program was aimed at, say, six here, let's take a look at one. Uh, we were on this page a good example of how fast one of these can load up. Um, so we're going to go to this page and we I think we were looking at the green, we we're looking at this program. So this is a program that has uh, this many appeals and so over here we actually have it's one program with 22 appeals uh, with 78,000 sends which is the sum of all of the appeals in the program. And then the touch points over here, this chart uh, is going to show uh, the touch points cumulatively for that appeal to the group it went to, uh, which and nobody got touched you know, to the six point time. It looks like the biggest ones here are at four. Uh, but obviously they got other appeals on top of that. So yes, you do want to tally them. But I'd also say you know, the sequencing here. So uh, if you do something like this, put a, and you can sort of see that some of these um, are the, the beige here is telephone and web. It looks like a telephone web balance uh, for this program. You sequence these in an order where you want to get the most impactful message and form out first and try to bring people over to donate. And then you follow up the ones that haven't donated with another one. So you know that's what's actually happening here if you look at the touch points. Some of them, well, let's just drop down and just add, I'm just going to drop in on that program. Um, whoops, I dropped in the wrong way. Hold on. This is all the stuff sent to the people in the program versus just the stuff in the program. Uh, we'll drop down this way. 
uh, and just look at the touch points in, in the program. So you can actually see uh, you know, some people up here got one, uh, two, three, it looks like up to four sends out of that program is the max. And it looks like you know this pe these people would have presumably got the first send and made a donation. And these people got the second send and made a donation. These people got the third and these got the fourth. And then the overall um, yield on the appeal would be, you know, we sent this to 6,000 people uh, and this many um, donated out of the collection of, um, looks like one to a half a dozen appeals or whatever many appeals there are already, 22 appeals. Uh, and then the appeals within it had different yields because this one may have been sequenced first, so it was to the, you know, got the most or whatever the sequencing is. I'm rambling a bit, but um, that's, that's the message here. You want to just balance this stuff. But uh, if you can group them like this into themes and then sequence things like that that work and be thoughtful. I mean, this is actually pretty thoughtful where, you know, they're not blasting people with this program. Uh, they're getting a nice balance. And you can actually see it looks like this. got yeah, quarter, 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 uh, one, two, three, four. You can see the emails, like kind of, uh, there weren't many for this first group. Uh, some more, it looks like emails came like probably later and then uh, stacked in on top of the, uh, the telephone. Actually, it looks like they came in the middle of the year, uh, time-wise. Uh, so they tallied on top of the phone calls. How are we doing on questions? It's uh, a lot of questions. Um, what has made the best success of getting analytics adopted into an organization? Great question. And we're actually going to run another webinar. Um, we're doing it with Wake Forest. And um, we did it for our user group. We're going to redo it for the entire community uh, late July, which is all about this. It's about how do you take this kind of stuff? And, and so we draw two, two, two examples. One is Wake Forest, where they have 160 people in their development team. There's 100 people who use something like this at least weekly. And it's frontline field officers, it's researchers, it's annual fund, it's deans, it's managers, it's the athletics program, it's essential, it's the law school, it's everywhere. Um, that's one example. We all like that. It's a good return on investment. The other one is you put something like this in and after six months or a year, two people use it and then one leaves so now there's one person and then that person's a total bottleneck and the whole thing falls apart and analytics don't become part of the culture. Um, the factors that really help that are senior management on board, uh, and then they, they showcase when it works. Like if you actually cut the mail sends by 25% and triple the revenue, that message ought to go out. And I know that case, uh, that's actually from a webinar last summer with Northern Illinois. It's uh, up on our website from like July or August of 14. You know, Sandy uh, had challenges because there was pushback on, you know, why are we going to cut this thing back? It's this concern. It's change. Is this actually going to going to hurt us? They did it smartly and it worked and then senior management you know gets behind it, it makes a huge difference uh, the second thing is um, there needs to be some kind of question scrum we call it uh, you know you train a team you can't just say go off um, there has to be some continuity where you get them back and say hey what do you think about the side bunt, uh fall off and reacquisition rate what do you want to do about it and use this to drive a discussion that'll get some discussion going and keep doing that and, and I think Wake Forest then went on and talks about how their, their Advancement Services Group is a resource. They posted videos on this. They've got short wiki posts on it. They're available to jump into a meeting if somebody gets stuck. So it, it's continuous. The third thing is uh, cut off the routes to the old way of getting stuff. Like if somebody's coming in and badgering somebody for a pile of reports and you've got this new way of doing it, don't give them the pile of reports. Tell them, go do it in a new tool and help them. Uh, cutting off the old routes. Uh, the fourth one uh, is keep it simple uh, and keep the projects focused. Uh, both of these I showed were fairly rich projects that you would not want to put out to most field officers or most managers. Uh, so don't. Uh, cut it back. You know, Do two pages with the key information and make it simple so that it's really consumable. I think the fifth point uh, that came out of that webinar was put this into onboarding and ongoing training. Um, Back to Wake Forest, the reason we just, one of the reasons I want to do this webinar is I went to the uh, North Carolina APRA conference and I sat down next to a new person at Wake Forest and she was all excited about advisors. How did you even learn about it? She said, well, when I started up, part of my core training was how to do analysis and answer questions with advisors. So they've institutionalized it. So, you know, it keeps new people get it. 
and it's it's you know when that happens it really is we this webinar is titled awesome analytics but it really is awesome analytics because the entire team is using it every day to make decisions and it's so different than you know hey I got this question you know Joe is the only one who knows how to answer it or I got to call in my favorite consultants and pay them a bunch of money and wait you know four months for an answer that's that's not so good either you know you want quick turnaround uh, jump in a room with four people dig into it we use the technical term muck around in the data. Uh, it's an analytic sandbox. You can't break anything. You can just explore um, and come up with answers. So I, I get pretty passionate about That was a great question because it triggered me into um, that whole topic area. And we're going to be doing a lot more with how do you get this into your culture starting with uh, the next webinar in late July. Phew. Um, I know we're running to our time limit. We've either bored everybody or we've we've run out of questions. Well, yeah, I'd say um, you know this is recorded. It's posted. If you have more questions, um, if I drop out of this, my contact is on the PowerPoint, which is the last slide. Uh, contact us. Uh, we love this stuff. We we really like empowering teams, and we think that you know people can on your teams can do this. It does not have to be complicated. It's you know you can set this up and you get tools like I just showed you. You know people can people can do this work and we're we're passionate about you know, sort of infusing that value into the uh, fundraising marketplace. So that's the deal. Uh, we'll let you know in a few days when this is posted and up on our website. Thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate it and uh, good rest of the day. Take care.